Uh, my name is Paul Forrestal. I'm the very proud Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs at Cuba College. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. Uh, we have students, we have faculty, we have staff, division chairs, members of the community. This is exactly what the Provost Lecture Series has been developed, uh, to the group that this lecture series has been developed to serve. Uh, it's an opportunity for all of the college community and the surrounding community uh, to be able to come here and hear presentations by a variety of uh, scholars distinguished in their field. And it's my great pleasure this evening uh, to welcome and introduce to you uh, Dr. Harvey Kushner, who is a terrorism expert. And if I were to uh, recite his credentials uh, for you right now, uh, it would pick up all the time that I need to award him for his presentation. Uh, Dr. Kushner got his uh, undergraduate degree at uh, Queens College at the City University of New York and his uh, master's and uh, PhD at New York University. Uh, he has for many, many years been the go-to person for all aspects of the impacts of terrorism, not only here in the United States, but uh, abroad as well. He has served as an expert in uh, legal investigations, in government uh, uh, panels, in efforts to try and understand and prepare for, in particular, the um, uh, horrors of uh, terrorism on the home front. He is the author of distinguished texts such as the Encyclopedia of Terrorism, which has won, won many awards, and his most recent text, Holy War on the Home Front. So uh, it is a great pleasure. I know Dr. Kushner uh, not only as an expert, but as a friend. He is the chair of the criminal justice uh, department at Long Island University, the Brookville campus, uh, where I also taught and knew him. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that he was willing to come and meet with us tonight. And I expect you will be too when you hear his presentation. I hope you enjoy the evening and take it away, Dr. Kushner. Thank you. Well, thank you, Paul. I, I, You might want to hold off till after you hear what I have to say. So, um, could all of you hear me back no, there? No, no. no, you can't. Back there, you can't hear me. You can uh, you, really? you take that out if you want okay. to. It might make it easier. Then. I got this one already. Oh, okay. It's already on. Better. <laughs> As I said, you might want to hold off the applause till after you hear what I have to say. Um, Thank you, Paul, and it, it's a pleasure coming here. Uh, in terms of a lot of the work that I've been doing over the years, uh, it, it's sort of refreshing to come to such a bucolic setting as the Finger Lake region, and especially Kuka College. Um, certainly, it's uh, sort of the point and counterpoint of, of, of terrorism. This seems to be the most lovely atmosphere. Uh, probably wouldn't want to hear what I have to say, but uh, I, I think it's important. And it's, it's interesting that I'm here um, after uh, last night's uh, debate. How many of you uh, How many of you saw the debate? Just raise your hands. Huh? Okay. Fairly good number. They say about uh, 70 million tuned into this uh, last debate. And uh, what I want to talk to you about is no matter who wins the presidency on November 8th, uh, whoever it is, they're in for a very difficult time. Uh, why? Because the threats that we face here in this country and abroad, uh, the world has never seen these threats before. And, and so um, what I want to spell out for you is that what the threat level is, what you could expect in the next four, eight, ten years, and how might either administration handle these threats? Because I think there's going to be a different approach. And what concerns the people in Washington, the people who deal with homeland security and counterterrorism, is they're very concerned that both parties uh, are not really fit for the job. That's whether or not, uh, I don't mean to insult you if you're a Clinton fan or if you're a Trump fan, but both have very serious shortcomings. And that's what the military is concerned about. I know you hear constantly 
by one of the candidates that there are over 100, 200, 300, a huge number of generals and military that support his candidacy. Well, that might be true. There's quite a few generals, there's quite a few military here in the United States. And on the other hand, you've seen uh, directors of um, intelligence agencies here come out for the other candidate, saying that the other person is not fit to serve. So it's a very difficult decision that you have to make. But let me just give you an idea, the threats and what the people who day to day have to deal with these threats, not someone who sits in the over room and somehow is, you know, insulated from what necessarily goes on in the real world. Uh, what, I w what we're trying to get here before up, and we had such difficulty with the technology, is this is a website here, uh, NORS, in which what you're viewing now is, anybody ever come across this site? Anybody? Well, what's fascinating is that this information is out there on the internet on a daily basis. You know, there's actually too much information out there. A lot of stuff that you shouldn't even see. And, and this is one of them. This site here is showing you right now, live, as it happens, these are cyber attacks that are happening as we speak. This is real time. Okay? And if you notice, you see there's targeting coming from a certain two areas, mainly. From the United States going out, and from China and Russia going in. And if you look at this side here, where it says attack origins, you'll see the United States now is launching the most cyber attacks as we speak. These are attacks not only on infrastructure, but on ATM machines, on military installations, Silicon Valley, um, industry. You know, uh, this might be an attack on, for example, Samsung, um, trying to take a look at what they're doing, what Sony might be doing. Um, and as you could see, they're, they're fast and they're furious. And, and you could also take a look at different regions where, you know, to see exactly. Um, where they're coming from. And if you notice, a lot of them are going out here to Silicon Valley, out to NORAD, up here in Alaska. Here's one, one big one that's, being, that's happening now. And you see there's a lot of different pings. Now, should you know that information? Well, that's, it's harmless in a sense to know it, right? But now let me show you something else that's also live time. Let me get up another site for you. I marked down here earlier. And um, this site here will show you also what's occurring as we, as we speak. Oh, the person actually, you know, see it's pulling it up here. Well, see, this didn't want to do it, so let me just go in. Let me get it to another way. Now what you're going to see now, if it loads, here we go. This is, right now, anybody know what that is right now? Yeah, that's, that's occurring right now, as we speak. That's what's up there, the current time. You notice weather isn't so bad, so it hasn't grounded. Now, this information is available to anyone. Now, if you notice, if I go to any one of these aircraft and I click on it, what it will show you, it will show you the plane this happens to be, look, Delta Flight 2588, Minneapolis to Boston. So this gives you the plane, the arrival time, this gives you all this information. Now I like this because I have it on my app, because I follow it, right? I want to know when my plane is coming in. But I don't have any evil intentions when that, of doing anything to that correctly. But, when you think in terms of what someone can do from here to something way up there, it gives you reason to pause. You know, Tesla just announced um, yesterday that all its new cars now drive itself, right? Self-driving automobiles. 
I mean, we have drones now, they're self-driving sort of planes, correct? But now what about if somebody wanted to take over control of that airplane? Is that possible? How many of you think it's possible from someone to take it over? Absolutely. And technology even makes it more possible. You know, when you get on a plane, they advertise that you could charge your phone. And you could also put a flash drive in, right? Connect it. Well, what if the flash drive has some evil intention? Think about that. Think about what... Actually, there was a case just recently where someone took over the plane through the entertainment system and flew the plane for about <coughs> five minutes sideways. So when you think of threat level and you think of cyberspace and the cyber issues that we face as a society, it's quite daunting. I mean, just what was it, about two weeks ago that Yahoo um, said they were, uh, had 500,000 hacks of their credit cards, uh, whether it's Target, Home Depot, all susceptible. And we as a society are really not doing very much to stop that. For example, uh, they claim now all these credit card companies send you the new card, you notice, with, with a chip in the card. Do you think that does anything, the chip in the card? You're shaking your head, yes. It does nothing. It would do something if you had a chip and a PIN number. You see, in Europe, if you notice, when you go into a restaurant and they bring over the machine right to the, you put in the chip, they ask you for a PIN number, correct? Because that makes it a fail-safe system. But we're just sticking it in and letting it read the chip is the same thing as doing a swipe. But you know, the major banks, the major department stores, they don't want to get you, you know, want you to shop. So at this point, they're not asking you to put in a pin, they're just asking you to, it's slow progress in this country. So now, instead of swiping, you'll notice some places you go in, they'll say insert the chip. But we still haven't gotten to the correct where you would have a chip and a PIN number. So the, po the point I'm making is that we're very vulnerable with the new technology. And, you know, recently you've been hearing, you heard it last night if you watched the debate, that the Russians have hacked into the system with WikiLinks and with a variety of other assaults that one candidate is claiming, right? Well, I don't know if it's the Russians, and neither does our government know if it's the Russians. It could be the Russians, it could be the Chinese, it could be a number of other people who are doing this. And then again, it might not be true, but the capability is there if one wanted to do that. And that's a risk that the next president is going to face in terms of protecting our society, the risk from cyberspace. And both sides whether it's the Clinton administration or the Trump administration, are going to approach it from a different perspective. And I think you should be aware of this. And I don't believe necessarily that either one is the correct method to use to protect the home front. And let me tell you why. You, hit, you heard in the debates, the first debate, the second debate, the fact is always the floating the idea about Putin, right? That Putin somehow, that Trump is kind of sanguine about Putin, that he's willing to cozy up to Putin. He says, well, if I could get the Russians to help fight with us to defeat ISIS in Syria, that would be good. Yes and no. It would be good if ISIS would be defeated. But at the same time, entering into an agreement with the Russian Federation to partner to fight the Syrians is not a good idea. Because Putin has a different agenda than does the President of the United States. And I'm not naive to think that they coincide with Trump's agenda. Now on the other hand, Hillary makes a statement that she's very anti-Putin, which is probably true. She's made some verbal statements 
that the Russian Federation is not her cup of tea. Because if you recall, when Trump said that NATO allies should pay their fair share, she got very upset and so did a lot of others in Washington saying that no, we have an obligation as sort of as say like it or not, the world's policemen, whether or not they pay their fair share, it's to um, our interest to have a strong NATO. And that we need to protect Japan, we need to protect Germany, we need to protect uh, all of Eastern and Western Europe. And Trump says, no, let them pay for it. Well, that in itself also poses some difficult issues for us. Because if we remove our protection from these countries, uh, the Russian Federation becomes much more aggressive. So on the one hand, it sounds good to have a relationship with the Russian Federation, and it might work to defeat ISIS, but at the same time, if you have that relationship, you're making Russia stronger. And what concerns me is that most Americans are not aware of what happens over there affects us greatly. Take, for example, price at your pump. You've noticed in the last year or so that the price of gasoline has went down considerably. Correct? You ask yourself why that's the case? Why is that happening? Why is the price of gasoline going down? Is it because of supply and demand? Does anybody really believe it's supply and demand that drives the price of oil down? Or does it have something to do with international relations and power politics. Who is the major player? Anybody. Who, who is the major player in causing the gas price at the pump to go down? Who, who was responsible for that? Anybody know? Take a guess. Saudi Arabia. Exactly. Why did Saudi Arabia want the price to go down? To keep Iran out of the market? To keep Iran out of the market? That might be. But could it also be the fact, what's that? To keep us out. To keep, well, we were, we were there, but mainly to drive the price down for the Russians, to get the Russians out of the market. And they continue to do this, and it would also affect even the United States, right? Because we were selling more gas. And gas becomes interesting when what? The price of oil goes what? up. Correct? So if oil goes up, gas becomes more favorable. And the Saudis didn't like that. So they decided to become cash poor by not cutting production. When if you thought, if it really was supply and demand, that production would get cut. But it didn't. Now, unfortunately for us, they have cut production. And they cut production because of what reason? What reason did they cut production? See, you should know these things because this drives your pocketbook. This affects you immediately. It's not what you what, what might think you read in a textbook or you hear. What's the reason for it? Why all of a sudden did the Saudis decide? And they were taking a hit. They had to borrow money. They were becoming cash poor. Why do you think the Saudis all of a sudden decided to cut production? Who are they going to punish now? <coughs> the United States. Why were they going to punish the United States? Anybody? Didn't the House and the Senate vote almost unanimously, with the exception of one vote, what they vote to do? To allow to allow victims of terrorism to sue foreign governments, and particularly the Saudis, because of the 28 pages that were redacted in that report. Now, I was privileged to be at the a VIP briefing the day before the 9-11 Commission released the report. We discussed this for two hours, that these 28 pages would be redacted. And every one of us knew what were in those 28 pages. And there was a, 
Well, it was sort of a, it wasn't a smoking rifle. It was sort of a smoking 22 caliber that was there in terms of indicting Saudis for knowing that 9-11 uh, occurred. And those were kept what? They were kept redacted and were kept off the market for quite some time. Well, the government most recently released them and you could find it on the web and read them. And they're not that thrilling, but there is some complacency there. But then, if, as you recall, the families lobbied in Washington to allow the Saudi government to be sued. And, and so if you remember, that was the first time that uh, Obama went against that. Obama, and, and I think it was Harry Reid, was the only one who voted against it. They said no. They, he tried to, he would veto it. But it was passed. And so in response to that, the Saudis cut production. So the point I'm trying to make is that oftentimes these decisions were economic and they're power political. They have a tremendous impact not only on your pocketbook, but on your safety. Because the world is really in turmoil now. When, I, when I'm in Washington, usually on a monthly basis or even more, and I speak with the Joint Chiefs of Staff and other people in that area, the Pentagon, and they're all very concerned. The concern is that we don't have the proper protocol to deal with what is occurring worldwide. We don't have real, real direction. We don't have a game plan. We don't have an end game plan. And, and, and that concerns me. You know, the Pentagon is very much like Wall Street. They want to know stability. They want to know two years out there where things are going. And they don't see that. They don't get that now because the general population is fed up with Washington. Politicians are, have, I think, the, I think the House and the Senate have a rating of under 10%. And if you look at the, both candidates, sadly to say, in the United States, that both candidates have a, a favorability rating, which is dismal. And, and you find people are supporting the other candidate because they don't like the other candidate which is, you know, that's all well and good if it just meant, you know, day-to-day -day dealings with domestic issues, but th this is our position in the world. And for the last, not just the Obama administration, but the Bush administration, we didn't get it right in any place. We screwed up a region of the world in the Middle East, which we had no end game, we had no business being there, we invaded a country, we, we disturbed the balance of power in the Middle East. You know, World War II was relatively short. How many years are we in Afghanistan? 15 years? And in Iraq, and the amount of blood and treasure that we spent in a region of the world, as I'm talking to you right now, the Taliban controls 10% of the population and, and th there's no way in sight we're going to be able to deal with that. The same thing, we destabilized Iraq and we made a kind of unfriendly Al-Qaeda into ISIS. We gave them territory. We didn't have an end game. We didn't realize that American Jeffersonian values are not necessarily the same values all over the world. I mean, we had a model which occurred after World War II with the Marshall Plan. We didn't have the same model in the Middle East. If you recall, uh, there was talk when we would go into Iraq and we toppled the statue of Saddam Hussein that we would be welcomed, that our troops would be welcomed with, um, you know, handing out silk stockings and chocolates to the <laughs> to the population the same way in France. You know that didn't happen. And what in fact we did is we replaced a largely secular, secular government with a non-secular government. 
and we, we're splitting apart the country. Because quite frankly, if our politicians understood that that region of the world, borders were man-made, mainly by the West. What we're doing is we're ripping them apart now. Now you have Iraq is going to is three different, three different countries. You have a, two religious facts. You have Sunnis, Shiite, and Kurds. And then if you take a look at the situation, what's happening in Turkey, and Turkey's position with the European Union, you know, don't you understand? Uh, and I, I don't mean this. Uh, I don't mean to be condescending. But the American public has to understand when they look at the pictures of all these refugees flooding into Europe, how come now? Why now? What's the cause? How are they getting in? How are they getting in? How are they crossing, you know, how are they getting out of Turkey? Because Turkey is letting them in. Turkey wants to get into the European Union but is not wanted by the European Union and the European Union is falling apart and it's being shored up by us you saw what the Brits did in an election just recently. And where every poll, let me remind you, where every poll said that wouldn't happen, even right up until election day, and even the exit polls that they were saying it wouldn't happen, they did split away. It, it, it's very concerning to me that we don't have leadership in Washington for, on either party that has a game plan that understands power politics and understands relationships between nations and nation states and understands to put America first, not in a way which is reactionary, but in a way which satisfies the demands of the American people. We don't have leadership as we had years ago when we had um, Dwight David Eisenhower, Truman, Roosevelt, who had a vision for this country. Now, granted, those were different times than they are now. But we live in much more hostile times. When you think about it, one person with his finger or her finger on a button could destroy the entire world. That wasn't the case before the atomic weapons were put into place. We've we created such a mess. I don't see, I, I, I don't know an end game of getting out, especially in, in the regions of the world that are just powder kegs. And, and, I, and I could name them. Uh, you know, you, 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 look at, you look at Syria, what's going, it, it's horrible, it's, it's heart-wrenching to see the children who are the victims of this horrible, horrible fight inside of Syria. And the same could be said of, of, of Yemen. The same could be said of Libya. The same could be said of Iraq. Egypt, fortunately for us, turned around. And that would have been a major hassle for the United States had Egypt not turned around from the Morsi government and the Muslim Brotherhood and moved back into, because they're the largest Arab nation in that region. And it would have been a formidable force if they were to continue down the road with Mohammed Morsi. And just to give you a little tidbit about that, you know, um, in 1993, um, Ramzi Yosef and Sheikh uh, Omar Abdel Rahman uh, and a few others uh, tried to take down uh, the World Trade Center. And uh, thank God they weren't successful. They placed a, a chemical weapon inside the building, um, sodium cyanide, but the heat of the explosion was so fierce that it vaporized uh, the sodium cyanide, so it didn't go into the air conditioning system in the building, which they wanted to poison 50,000 or so people that were there. The two people who I defended in a major lawsuit against the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which we won tens of millions of dollars the day before we went to trial, um, they survived, and, um, and, but they had the sodium cyanide burns in their nostrils and their esophagus, but nobody else in, in the building uh, did that. And w w when, when, that, when that took place, that time, we had warnings that it would, would happen again. And we, we weren't interested. As a, as, a, as, a, as a country, because we didn't think that type of terror happened here in the United States. 
And I remember in 95, in open court in New York, where, Ram or where Ramsey Yosef was trial, he said that uh, he had a Project Bochinka. Project Bochinka was he was going to hijack 12 wide-body planes over the Pacific, fly a few of them into buildings, and uh, blow the rest up. And he experimented with one in which he had um, someone sit at a certain part of the plane, which was uh, very serious for us because it was with a fuel line passed, and the person lit his shoe on fire, and the plane blew up a, a, a hole on the side of the fuselage, but it was at 14,000 feet, so only he died and the person next to him died and the plane landed successfully. So when the government said after, we had no idea, and by the way, Ramsey Yosef and Murad at trial said they didn't want to be able to fly the plane, take off the land, they just wanted to fly the plane. So when 9-11 occurred, and everyone said uh, we had no idea about shoe bombs, or when Mr. Reed tried to do it after 2001, and when finally the towers came down, uh, we had no idea. Well, let me tell you something. You know who's the mastermind? Anybody know who the mastermind of um, the 9-11 attack was? Sheikh Khalid Mohammed. Do you know who Sheikh Khalid Mohammed is? He's Ramsey Yosef's uncle. Nice family affair, ain't it? And so our intelligence agencies really were asleep for a long time because we knew this threat was coming. We did nothing. We did nothing when our troops were slaughtered in the Lebanon. What did President Reagan do when a, over 225 Marines were killed in, in Lebanon? He withdrew, right? And then for a period of how many years did our people face torture, kidnapping, right? In the Middle East, in Lebanon, right? They killed um, uh, generals. They hijacked uh, Terry Waite, Anderson, for about 10 years, testing us. In Mogadishu, what was our response? What was our response uh, all for the embassy bombings? When they blew up two embassies, at once. We did nothing. What about the USS Cole? So this has been a long period of testing us. And you would have thought after decades of this that Washington would have ramped up its ability to deal with this particular storm that was on the horizon. But really nothing was done because we had a full sense of security. You know, the old Soviet Union was taken apart, right? They invaded Afghanistan, and we supplied the Mujahideen. We supplied the Mujahideen with weapons and training and Stinger missiles. We actually built the Batcave where bin Laden hid out in Afghanistan. And why did we do this? We wanted to embarrass the Soviet Union for what? for embarrassing us in Vietnam. You know, the enemy of my enemy is my friends. So we, we hooked up with the Mujahideen. And the blowback from the Mujahideen were Ramsey Yosef and Sheikh Rahman. You know, in 1979, there was the Iranian Revolution and the Ayatollah, outed the Shah. When the Ayatollah outed the Shah, the world was shocked that that happened. And where did he engineer that? He engineered it from France, not from inside of Iran. When Sheikh Rahman came to the United States, his goal was not necessarily to overthrow us. He wanted to engineer a takeover of what? Egypt. Egypt, my friends. He wanted to take over Egypt. That was his goal, to take over Egypt. He wanted to oust Hosni Mubarak because the people, Zawahiri, who is now a head of Al-Qaeda, the doctor, Zawahiri was there 
during the assassination of who was assassinated? Anwar Sadat. And there's pictures. We, I show them in my training clips of Zawahiri and Rahman jailed after the assassination of... You would think that our intelligence agencies would monitor this and understand where is this all going. And I'll tell you where it all goes. When the Obama administration supported the Arab Spring in Egypt, they supported the Muslim Brotherhood to take over Egypt and oust, but, you know, Mubarak. They threw him, literally, the expression goes, under the bus. And Mohammed Morsi took over. And let me tell you, you don't read about this in the papers here, you didn't hear about it, but it's all true. The day he was inaugurated, Mohammed Morsi, the day he was inaugurated, you know what he said? He asked for the release of who? Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman. He asked the President of the United States to release him from prison here because he's a freedom fighter, fighting for the freedom of... So it's interesting that Rahman came here to start it all, but it came full circle when Morsi was able to do it through a ballot through our help. That's, my friends, sheer stupidity, sheer inability to understand what the rising threats are worldwide. There is a Roman relationship between all of these events. There are connections. There are dots that are being put together. You know, and we continue to do this. Because when we got tacked on 9-11, yes, we needed, to, we got caught, you know, with, with our intelligence agencies had no ability to deal with that. Our military didn't have an ability to deal with that. It took us some time to ramp up. But you would think that when we did that, we're not going to now go in one direction and forget about the other direction. You know what we did? We moved our entire intelligence apparatus, whether it's the CIA, the NSA, or other intelligence agencies that you don't know about, they moved them in the direction of looking at the Middle East, looking at the Middle East, looking at the Middle East, and you know what they forgot about? The Russian Federation. And so, people of my era understood communism, understood the Russian Federation, but now you had young FBI agents who were cutting their teeth on, on Al-Qaeda. Knew nothing about the Soviet Union. In fact, when uh, my wife and I were down in Washington lobbying for the Republic of Poland at the House Foreign Relations Committee, we talked about the threats that were coming in Georgia. And you know what the response was? What's the problem down south? <laughs> That's your House Foreign Relations Committee. There's a problem down south. Georgia. let alone, say, Belarus or the Ukraine, I, I will bet you that one of the candidates, maybe even both, don't know that Ukraine was part of, was Kiev and part of the Soviet Union. But the Russian Federation dropped communism and changed. It, it, it's still the same. Putin's the same. Putin is the same person. And the Red Russian Federation is the same as the Soviet Union. It's now oil and gas and a bunch of thugs. But we didn't realize years ago, which we should have, that we need to be able to understand these different relationships that exist outside the United States. Because, you know, as a country, we were able to develop our natural resources. You want to know why? For two reasons. The Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. And the lack of technology in being able to transverse those two great areas. Think about it. If Great Britain, or if England at the time, decided to pull out of their neck of the woods and come here in 17, after the Battle of Lexington on April 19, 1775, do you think they could have beaten us? You bet your sweet life they would have beaten us. But they couldn't. Why couldn't they? Because if they pulled out of there, they had the French to deal with, they had other balance of power. They couldn't. For crying out loud, they came back here in 1812 and burnt down our capital. They supported the South during the Civil War. And then President Monroe came out with the Monroe Doctrine. 
And you know what the Monroe Doctrine was? You can't, no more developing in North and South America, Latin America. And for many years, we grew up strong as a country thinking, wow, that we're really deterring them. You know what, that didn't it. When there was the first violation of the Monroe Doctrine? Cuban Missile Crisis. For all those years, Europe was fighting among themselves, couldn't come here. You know what I just did, folks? I just called Siri for some reason. She just asked me, what do you want? <laughs> you know? That's, if you downloaded, no, you see, there she did. Hello, Siri. Hello. <laughs> That's so embarrassing. Sometimes I, 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 I pocket call Siri from, from my pocket. Um, but, but the point I'm trying to make about all this is there is a relationship between our, our, the threats that we face and who perpetrates them. But we need, in Washington, we need leadership, really, leadership that is able to put this together. Really, and, and not just for short-term planning, but long-range planning. I mean, there are many obstacles in dealing with this. There's a thing called political correctness, which becomes very, very difficult to deal with at times. Uh, there's also, you know, um, everybody's walking around with a cell phone, with a camera. And, and, and you also have a media that's out of control. Literally, that's out of control. I mean, when you think about it, what right does the media have to push a candidate? And, and, and you know they do. I mean, I get the biggest kick out of turning on MSNBC, then turning on Fox, and then turn, just to see the point and counterpoint between them. But when you think about that, they drive an election. But the stakes, I, I think, are greater now than they ever were before because of the threat levels that we face, whether it's in cyberspace, whether it's in regions of the world that are on fire, whether it's refugees that we take in, uh, which we have no way of vetting. Really, no way of vetting. I mean, I, I know it's tough to stand up here and you say when you see a child that's injured, not to reach out for that child. Well, maybe the idea was no fly zone, where, where people are safe in, in that area. But that poses a problem too. The problem, you know, with Obama was he was afraid of the no-fly zone for what reason? Because the Russians would penetrate it, then he'd have to answer them back. Well, right now, you know, you, you might not realize this, but there's a, we're at the edge now of recreating another Cold War, especially in cyberspace. There's talk in Washington of a, a massive cyber attack against the Russians for what they believe they did with the WikiLeaks. But I'm not so sure that they have that down pat that they know exactly that it was the Russians who were involved in that. And what concerns me, uh, probably the most of all, is that we're, we're asleep as a nation. I mean, when you, when you think about it, one of the things that upsets me the most is, and, and things happen gradually. If you remember the election with um, Bush and the hanging chads, that was a concern of mine because they were looking at him if they hang this way, hang that way. And then, you know, we started to think and say, well, it it's hinges on Florida. And his brother's the governor of Florida, you know, and then you have the Supreme Court decide uh, the decision. And now you have two candidates, really, it's very disturbing, where the talk was last night, well, would you support? Uh, if, if someone won, would you? Well, I'll hold, ba I'll hold back. And the whole question of whether or not the election's rigged. I mean, there is a point w about that. There is some election fraud. And, and certainly the media helps push it and inflame it in that way. But this is what makes America great because the ability to for transition from one administration to another administration and do that peaceably. It was extraordinarily what happened during the Bush-Gore transition. You really weren't concerned about literally a civil war occurring. But you'll hear that mentioned now, and, that, and that's frightening because it's more frightening if we didn't have a position to defend in the world. And we have that position to defend. No matter what you think, the United States is the only super, real superpower in the world. I mean, we, we have our problems, we have all our issues, whether it's an economy, whether it's social problems and that, but we also have to protect the home front 
in terms of threats that come at us uh, continuously. And it concerns me that um, both candidates have a, a very disturbing track record, to say the least. One in which was in a position of power and didn't know what the C meant. Maybe thought it was copyright, <laughs> you know? I get emails from NATO and they say unclassified on it, and, you know? I, I understand that. You mean to tell me the Secretary of State wouldn't, wouldn't understand that? I mean, and to have your these emails on a um, personal server, you know, is, is, is problematic to say the least. Uh, on the other hand, you know, when Trump was queried about the nuclear triad, he didn't know that, which, which was disturbing. And he said he knew more about ISIS than the generals. That was disturbing on, on its face, you know. Not that all the generals know all that much either, but the, 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 the point is that it's amazing uh, our technology and our ability in this 21st century, but yet Washington seems to be, seems to be crumbling at a point in time when it's dangerous for this country. Extraordinarily dangerous. You know, in about 1870, we, in, we moved into being the number one economic power in the world. Now there's question whether or not uh, China hasn't taken over on that, on that point. And, and, and then again, we, we face a major threat not only from Russia, but from China. Chinese, for many centuries, were inward. They look, weren't looking for expansion. Now they are. In fact, we were thrown out of the Philippines. But we've been asked recently to come back to the Philippines because of the threat from, from China. You know, things have a way of shifting, but they're not shifting to the better for this country. And that's why I think, as educated consumers, it's your duty to put people in place who could make, make decisions. Because trust me, once you get to the top, you're bogged down by, by who supports you, by budgets, by politics. It's like my sources in the FBI tell me that they're livid about what went on during the investigation. That there was significant amount of, but, but Comey, and, who's a good man, and who, uh, by the way, is a Republican, but Comey was put in a very awkward position, and he, you know, he said he didn't want to decide the election. Literally, he didn't want to decide the election, because if he would have moved for indictment, that would have been a decision that would have, could have decided the election. But on the other hand, you got a feel for Mr. Comey because why? He did decide the election by not, by not moving to indict. And, 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 and this and there is, is a major problem. If anyone in this room would have done the same thing, you would have all been indicted. General Petraeus with the same um, uh, uh, things that he had with his email uh, ran into trouble. So, you know, and, and this is what would have been okay in a world in which you didn't know. You didn't know. If we, if we take us back, if we take us back to the 30s, when you had Franklin Delano Roosevelt as president, he had a guy with infantile paralysis who was who couldn't stand up on his own. There's only a few pictures of him standing up with braces and, and in a wheelchair. But most of the American public didn't even know that. And you know, the media honored that. The paparazzi of that time were relatively bland. They did not photograph him in his wheelchair or with braces. It's not the same as it is in Washington now. You know, it's funny. When we go down there, we used to stay, uh, we, don't, we stay now with uh, Hay Adams, but there's a hotel called the Willard. The Willard is right on Pennsylvania Avenue. And in the Willard, um, President Taft used to walk from the White House, which is about 
800 feet, 1,000 feet away. Every night he used to walk across the street and he used to go, go into the bar to have a drink with no guards. No guards. And, you know, when he went in there, he would, he, to get to the bar, he had to go through the lobby. So a lot of people used to wait for him in the lobby and he used to start to chat him up about certain things that they wanted, favors they wanted from him. And when he went home one night, he said to his wife, she says, how would you enjoy the evening? He says, well, those damn lobbyists. <laughs> that's, that's where the term lobbyist came from. But then Harry Truman, Harry Truman used to leave the White House, walk down Constitutional Avenue, right? And he'd say, after a meal, because he's going out, and that became shortened to, I'm going out for a Constitutional. <laughs> that's where that term came from. Today, when we stay there, we're usually there every month, we're right across from the White House. It's amazing. They shut down the streets all around there. I mean, literally two, three blocks around there. When you go over and you look at the top of the White House, you see the sharpshooters on the top of the roof. You see the dogs. It's, it's a different world. It, it's a different world. It's a better world, but it's also in some cases, it, it, you know, it, it, it's not the same. And I think with our intelligence capabilities now, and the technology that we have, it's really a shame that we don't have the appropriate analysis uh, to make us safe. Because when, when we're, we, we've come to accept that there's going to be another shoe's going to drop. I don't think there's anybody in this room who doubts that there's not going to be another Orlando, or San Bernardino, or, any, or another Paris, uh, another Brussels, right? You all think, well, just when is it going to come? <laughs> and how bad it's going to be. We've grown to accept that. And, and that's horrible for our children and their children to live in a world that way. You know, look, I understand if you turn on, some of you won't remember this, you're too young, but you saw Father Knows Best or Leave It to Beaver or all of these shows. Or, you know, my father used to take me to a Yankee game. Uh, he used to wear a suit and a tie. You know, a suit and a tie to a Yankee game. Uh, you, you, you don't see that now. You know, you don't even want to take a young kid to the, you know, for the, for the cursing that goes on. And the, you know, they had to stop serving bottles because they would throw them on the field, right? So, you know, it, it's, it's very disconcerting to me to know that our future is going to be one of accepting that this is a way of doing business. And I blame it really on our leadership, because there has to be some leadership that takes a look at what the future is going to bring and how, what we do as a country, who we let in, how we vet people, what we do as a nation in supporting other nations. Where does our money go? You know, uh, you always hear these things about, I, I remember after 9-11, after 9-11, New York City, uh, uh, a couple of us had to testify in front of uh, City Council in New York about whether or not we should stay at high alert. This was like October 15th, after, just one month later. And, and it was the consensus of, of all of us to um, say, yeah, that we need to stay vigilant. And New York did, because New York learned the hard way, New York City, that they have to protect themselves. They can't rely on the federal government. Federal government is not going to be there for New York 24-7. In fact, Ray Kelly, the former police commissioner, went on um, television on 60 Minutes and shocked America when he said, he shouldn't have said it, they have the capability of shooting down a plane. The NYPD trains for that they could take down a plane. I remember CBS came to my house to interview me and I said, look, that's fine if the plane is in an open field, but coming down to LaGuardia and you shoot a plane down there, it could be, it could be disastrous to the people on the ground. But why New York City felt that way is New York City felt that, look, after one, six months after 9-11, there also was, another, you know, I don't know if you had them here, but if you lived in New York then, if you could remember the F-16s, which were flying constantly over New York, and what was a shame about that was not all of them were American pilots. They were NATO pilots. And they were Canadians. 
it was interesting that we didn't have enough of our own pilots to do that duty. Well, what happened was there was another conference just like at the, at the council, this time it was in Washington, and the question that they asked us was what? Should we stop those flights? This was just a few months after. And we said no, because the threat level hasn't gone away. We haven't hard, hardened the cockpit and the plane. We still have those issues. And the government's argument was, look, it's costing us almost $500,000 a day to do this. Well, hold that for a second and think when we invaded Iraq and we went into Afghanistan, the money we spend a day there makes that look like just a few coins. It's amazing that the American public bought this, bought this worldwide invasion that we were going to change a whole region of the world. I mean, I'm astounded by this. I'm really astounded by, they didn't understand what the domino effect is going to be by taking down that region. If there's anyone in this room who thinks that there is a solution to that region of the world right now, raise your hand. No, seriously, does anybody think that, do you think that's going to be problematic for the United States as we move forward? Don't you think that should have been thought out before we went in? What are we going to do once we topple the, the regime? Why didn't we know that Iraq was a buffer to Iran? This is incredible. You know, one thing that Donald Trump is saying is actually true, but he doesn't articulate it very well. You know, there was a point in time after the fall of the Soviet Union when we started to cut back on our nuclear weapons. And for a whole long period of about 10, 15 years, we did no development, absolutely no development. But the Russians did. And when Obama pushed us into signing that treaty with the Russians to limit the number of weapons we would have, the number of weapons we have compared to theirs is outdated. Ours are not high-tech weapons, theirs are high-tech weapons. So we lost on that particular deal. And, and you know what? If we wanted to retreat and we wanted to become an insular nation which wasn't out there with NATO, wasn't involved in the world, that's a different story. But if you look at America as an empire, as a beacon of light in the international relationship between nation states, then you have to understand we have to be strong and we have to have the power to back us up. But unfortunately we don't, we don't have that status. You know, many years ago there was a book called The Ugly American. And, and it was quite accurate how Americans would go to a foreign land and, you know, be pretty much loud, boisterous and, uh, you know, uh, show off and things. Well, you know, those days were better than today. Today, you know, we're, we're not looked upon favorably by many of our allies for the lack of understanding of these issues which we, in a sense, caused. You know, it's funny. Um, Trump says he was against the war in Iraq and that. Well, I, I, I see YouTube things and I see what is. I remember I was on the factor. Uh, about two and a half weeks after 9-11. And, and Bill O'Reilly asked me, what should we do? And I said, we should get involved, but not in a land war. If you want to get involved in that region, do it with special ops. You know, I, I find it so bizarre that people don't focus in on what you should understand is a reality of the situation. You know, Ben Laden, didn't you always wonder how he would get the tapes to Al Jazeera and we couldn't, we couldn't trace it? How we got reporters inside to see him? Five reporters went in to see him. They got in to see him and got out. It's a sad situation. You know, uh, a good friend of mine was Moorhead Kennedy. Moorhead Kennedy 
was the head of our embassy in um, Tehran when they took it over for 444 days in 79. And when President Reagan became president, uh, taking over for Jimmy Carter, what they did was what happened? They released our, our prisoners, right? And he, he, he was immediately flown to, to Germany and he had his physical. And then he came back here to the States. And he was wondering, when am I going to get contacted by the, by the State Department and by the CIA and the NSA to debrief me? And it never came. They never debriefed him. And most of the hostages volunteered to be debriefed, and the government didn't want to debrief them. Why? Because the United States at that time was, was different. The pendulum was swinging from the right all the way over to the left. And I'll leave you with this thought, and then I'll take some questions if you want. It's very unhealthy when your leaders don't meet hard decisions head on and address them. Because what happens when you try to tamp it down and you try to make it politically correct, what you do is you push it under the rug and it stays there. It doesn't go away like a cancer. You have cancer, you have to cut it out and then possibly do chemo or radiation. You just don't put talcum powder over it and say, don't take a look at it. We've been doing that for so many years. It's my suggestion that that's why you have what you have in Washington now. You get two extremes that come out. You get one that's far right and one that's far left. And the beauty of America always was not only a large economic middle class, but a middle class who had middle class thoughts and ideals and goals. Really, they, they weren't looking for a free meal. They weren't looking for food stamps. They were looking for an honest day's work. And so, this country never was addressing that middle part that we crave as a nation. Because in all the countries that I've been to in dealing with the counterterrorism behind the scenes, I can tell you this, from London to Belgium to, to Paris, every one of those countries segregates their populations. You cannot integrate into Germany. You cannot integrate into Belgium. You cannot integrate into France. That's why they have these significant problems. That third generation Algerians in France never integrated. Because you're, ne you're never really French. You're never really German. You're Turkish. That's not the case in this country. This country is supposedly is welcoming for that, for the integration of people. That is what the middle class was. That was the large middle class in this country. And I think when we don't have our politicians address those problems head on. You know, during World War II, we were, we were not at war with Blitzkrieg. We were not at war with kamikazes. We were at war with Nazi Germany. We were at war with fascist Italy. And we were at war with Imperial Japan. We had no problem naming who our enemy is. Today, it's politically incorrect to name your enemy. It's become insane. You know, when I, when I trained law enforcement agencies um, prior to this administration, you were able to use the P word, profile. You can't use that today. So how do you describe something if you're leaving out a main characteristic? For example, um, terror. War on terrorism. No such thing as a war on terrorism. That's a concept. Just like there's no such war, a war on drugs. Hey, I like drugs. When I'm sick, I take an antibiotic. You know? That's a drug. We need to get real and understand that we, our enemy does have a face. Our enemy does have a goal. Oh, we're not at war with Shining Path. We're not at war with the Irish Republican Army. We're not at war with Ba'ath separatists. We're not at war with Um Shariko. We're not at war with any number of terrorist organizations that are active worldwide. We're at war with militant Islam.
it's clear. And if any moron thinks that if you say those words that you're painting everybody with the same brush is entirely wrong. You've got to give the American people more sense to, uh, uh, to understand that. Just like we were in a war with Germany, with all Germans. We didn't say we're at war with Blitzkrieg. We adapted that, in fact, to our football lingo, right? You know, the Blitz and, and that. So, you know, a lot of these problems that we face can all be dealt with if we as a nation meet head on what the challenges are and try to discern what they are. Because we don't have any intelligent uh, conversation any longer. I mean, if, if you take a look at the debates, you're supposed to talk about foreign policy, and the way they discuss foreign policy is in name calling and, 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 and facial expressions and innuendo without any kind of, you know, and, and we vilify people. But it's interesting how the media will use, you know, I invite you all to, to you know, YouTube, go on YouTube and Google Dick Cheney and Google Iraq. And I think you're going to be shocked when you see what he said. He said, I wouldn't go in there. But yet, you know, they say he was the engineer of the whole thing. But look what he said. He said, you can open up a Kragmai. You can open up an area of the world where we're not going to be able to control it. So, please, try to be as educated as you can about international relations, about the relationships we have with other governments, and what you want for your future. Because you're the only ones who going to be able to solve this. It cannot be done just by the people in Washington. It's impossible. And another reason is, and I just keep on throwing these thoughts out to you, during World War II, everybody had skin in the game. Everybody. In fact, people who weren't serving in the military in World War II were embarrassed. Women then went to work with you. They built the airplanes, especially from the region where I'm from, Long Island. They went to Republic. They went Rosie to Riveter. They pitched in. But when we were attacked on 9-11, which was much more gruesome than Pearl Harbor, not everybody has skin in the game. Our military is all volunteer. It's all volunteer. So you have 1% of the population carrying the water for everyone else. Think about that. You have to have skin in the game to really feel uh, you know, think about it. I remember, I'm old enough to remember as a kid, uh, um, having a coupon book for butter and for meat. And you didn't get certain color clothes because that, those dyes were made to uh, uh, make um, uniforms. We saved tinfoil, rubber bands, all of these things, collected all of this for the military and bought war bonds. You see any of that today? You can't even suggest that. People look like you're nuts. I've always asked my classes, you know, how many here want to go fight for your country? Nobody raised their hand. Well, one. Okay, thank you. I did. You did? Good. Do you, do you feel that way? Yeah. How do you feel? I just I want to ask you. I don't want to put you on the spot. When people come up and say to you, thank you for your service, right? Don't you feel like, yeah, why are you thanking me? Why don't you go do it? Yes. It's definitely two-sided. I mean, there's a small number of people that do it, and people say they're grateful, but they don't really mean it. No. It's kind of like, um, historically, you'd see, um, oh, you know, Veterans Day, you know, people would go out, you know, you go to a restaurant, the restaurant would give your family the free dinner. Right. Today, people try and find excuses, and I, I don't need it. I hear them good. Oh. Oh. Okay. Um, so, you know, today, it's kind of like, you know, on Veterans Day, I'll go out, and I'll ask people, like, hey, do you by chance give a military discount? And they're like, oh, no, sorry, we don't. It's a shame. It is. Where did you serve? Uh, in the Army, I was at Fort Drum up by Watertown. Were you overseas? Were you deployed? Luckily, no. Oh, I but I was only in for four years for the GI Bill. I'm currently in the inactive reserve. Okay. But I was right out of high school. Yeah. Anybody else want to have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, this is a, a friendly question. This is a, a friendly question, although it might not start out that way. Uh, you said on the, well, we know on November 8th we're going to have new leadership. And you said already that, uh, that the new the leadership we're going to have on November 8th is, is not the right kind of leadership and our, 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 our ready. And, and the problem is uh, the political system. 
right? Uh, and, 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 and you lay out all the reasons why we have been in trouble, why we are in trouble, and why it's, it's, it's going to get worse. But now my, my, my friendly, uh, unfriendly question. Uh, you've told us all the problems, like Hillary does and like Trump does, but, uh, but and, and then solution? they gave us a general kind of solution. What, what can we do now? So that four years from now, we won't be in exactly the same situation. Okay, I have a, a direct answer for that. The, the same answer that put us in this position. Some of you might remember, back in the 60s, when we had the Vietnam War, we had drugs being entered into society, and we had race relations that were going south, right? We had riots, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and there was massive insurrection in this country. If you remember then, the government put together a commission called the Kerner Commission by Governor Kerner, and he took people from a cross-section of America. He took college professors, he took um, police, he took um, uh, from manufacturing industry, uh, religious leaders, he took um, uh, politicians. He put them together to come up with a solution uh, and do a report, what's happening to our society? And they came out with the Kerner Report, and the Kerner Report said we're developing two separate societies and they're unequal. And that's, and they had some suggestions of how to deal with that. And one thing they said that the media was biased. The media was biased to the right. And we needed more people who were to the left in the media. And that opened that up. The point is, what the pendulum at that time was on one direction, and you also had um, Jimmy Carter, who uh, appointed uh, Attorney General Levy, who put in the Levy guidelines. What the Levy guidelines were, were that you couldn't open up a case file on an individual unless there was a criminal predicate. Because up until that time, J. Edgar who, if he didn't like the way you looked, he had a case file on you. He didn't like, for example, Gene Seberg. Gene Seberg, who was a movie actress, blonde, blue-eyed, was dating an African-American, and he thought that was bad, so he had a case file on Gene Seberg. He had a case file on Frank Sinatra, because he thought he was an organized crime. He had a case file on Mickey Mantle, because he thought he drank too much. He had a case file on so many actors. The FBI had 45,000 case files. They had one on Martin Luther King, not for his civil rights, but because he was a womanizer. And, and J. O. Hoover didn't like that. So when they passed the Levy guidelines, making you had to have a criminal predicate or a crime to have taken place, the 45,000 case files dropped down to 800. That was an outcry of the Kerner Commission. So the America started to go more, the pendulum, in the other direction. We started to, the Church Amendment was passed, in which when we get people from the CIA, they couldn't have a check it passed. I mean, how stupid was that? You want a choir boy to be an infiltrated group? So what we need now, really, we, we need a commission of sensible people from all different walks to get together to see where we're going to go. I'm not talking about saying cutting our constitution, but just like that Kerner Commission coming up. And in fact, what happened at that time, that's why I'm standing here before you. They passed the Omnibus Safe Streets and Crime Act back in 68, and that led to the development of LEA, the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, which developed funding for homecoming vets called LEAP Funds, Law Enforcement Educational Program, and I was in the sociology department. And we got a grant from Washington of three point million to develop, what? A criminal justice system. Because in, in the late 60s, early 70s, the country was, there was riots, cities were burning down, drugs were becoming rampant, and that's how we solved that, and look what we've done. Over the years, we've changed everything. Our first class at the university were all white Caucasian males. Now, my Department of Criminal Justice is the most diverse on campus. We have females. Nassau County, that year, didn't even have a female police officer. New York City was all white. And so, just in a relatively short time, since 1970 and above, we've changed our criminal, a lot of, look, we have a lot of work still to do in the criminal justice system, but you've got to agree it's changed. You drive through southern states and you see a state trooper who is an African American. You didn't see that back in the 50s and the 40s. So, given the problems we face, given the threat levels that are, have come, you know, we really need to have a new Kerner Commission. Somebody has to rise up. You know, people like uh, Governor Kerner, uh, Go uh, um, Senator Brooke from Massachusetts was on it. Uh, John Lindsay, 
the mayor of New York was, was on that committee. Uh, one, of my, uh, uh, my, one of my mentors for my PhD was on that committee. Uh, and, and so we need to do that. We have to get the best minds together to think where are we going to go because, look, you know, I'm a strong believer in the Second Amendment. Uh, incredibly so. You know, because I have a gun permit, I have a full carry permit. Because I've been threatened. So, and, and it's hard to get one in New York City, and I have a New York City carry permit. But, but the point is, you know, when you have AK-47s, and you know, if my neighbor's gonna put a howitzer on the roof, I have a problem with that. So, we, we need really to have an honest dialogue about this, not from the extremes, but really to, to solve the situation. You know, like Steve Wynn, who's the head of Wynn Corporation, of the Wynn Hotel in Vegas, he was interviewed the other night by um, Neil Caputo, and they asked him, they always ask you, because you're a billionaire, what's fair taxes? He says, let's have an intelligent conversation about what's the fair taxes. He says, 5% of, of America pays 90% uh, uh, of all taxes, the top 5%. So let, uh, he says, I'm not again, but let's talk about it in a logical, we're not doing that. We're yelling at each other, and we're yelling at each other from, from extremes. And I find that really disturbing. You know, uh, I'm wearing the Gipper's cufflinks. Okay? I'm wearing, my wife gave them to me as a gift. They're hardest to get in Washington. They're the most expensive to, to get the, the Reagan cufflinks. And a lot of people look at Reagan and they say he was this big hawk. He wasn't a hawk. He wasn't a hawk at all. In fact, a lot of people thought he was a dub when he took, moved out of Lebanon and didn't defend our troops. But at least he had an ability to think things out. We're not, we're not having that. We're yelling at each other. So the answer to that, my solution is, there's not one person who could do it. It needs to be people from different parts of society that get together. You know, for example, on this um, cyber threat which I talked about, next Wednesday I'm putting together for, I put together for the New York State Controller's Office, downstate, we're going to have a meeting at the Hilton on, in Huntington in which we're bringing together the public sector and the private sector. And we want them to talk about this threat. You know, how could the private sector help the public sector? Because everyone knows the public sector doesn't get the talent that the private sector does. I mean, we were just out in Silicon Valley, and when Google wants to hire you, they're hiring you at $200,000, $250,000, and you're getting rent, and you're getting a car. How, how does our law enforcement agencies and those who are protecting the public side, could they attract that kind of talent? No. And, and when you think about it, I mean, I, I, I don't mean to, um, you know, when they rolled out online the whole Affordable Care Act. You remember what kind of fiasco it, it went down? Hey, when Amazon rolls something out, or Walmart rolls something out for much less money, that thing works like a charm. I mean, imagine Amazon saying, we're not gonna be able to handle 5,000 clicks a minute. They're gonna be able to handle it from the, from the get-go, because that's the ingenuity of the private sector. So entrepreneurship and that, and I think universities play an important role in that. I think that's what QQ College could do. Paul and I discussed that. And I, and I think that, that's a service to the country by bringing together the public and private sector as a platform here to discuss this, to come out with some type of solutions. I mean, I'm not saying cut the whole thing, throw the baby out with the baby, but I, I do think we, we need to be flexible a, a, and change. You know. Sorry. Uh We've run a little bit over, so I want to, first of all, take the opportunity to thank Dr. Kushner for his presentation.